Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Baldridge Foundation's quarterly webinar. As a reminder, due to the high number of participants, everyone will be kept on mute during the presentations. If you have any questions, please submit them to the moderator in the questions box located on your control screen. Presenters will answer questions during our panel discussion. Here is today's agenda and featured guests. Ellie DiMartino, Deputy City Manager, Fort Collins, Colorado. Patrick Lawton, City Administrator, City of Germantown, Tennessee. And Tommy Gonzalez, City Manager, El Paso, Texas. These presentations will be followed by questions from the audience and then a brief update from Bob Fangmeyer, Director, Baldridge Excellence Program, NIST, and Brian Lassiter, Chair, Alliance for Performance Excellence. We will then have a few closing remarks. Now it is a privilege to turn the presentation over to our first guest, Kelly DiMartino, Fort Collins, Colorado. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for the chance to be here. I'm very excited to join you today. I start by sending um, apologies and regrets on behalf of our city manager, Darren Atterbury. He was very much looking forward to participating with all of you today and unfortunately is dealing with a back injury um, that makes him unable to be here today. So again, um, I appreciate the chance to join you on his behalf. You know, um, just want to start by saying who would have ever anticipated when 2020 started, right? Um, all of us as community members and as local, um, in our world, local government professionals, but business leaders, whatever your background is, you know, we're um, used to dealing with emergency situations. I think we've all been through crises before. We know how to navigate our organizations and um, adapt. But never before have, um, at least I been in a situation where, you know, the entire United States has been declared a disaster area and um, we're in the midst of so many moving pieces and parts. So this concept of navigating with resilience is something that really, really resonates. And I know for us, certainly as an organization, we talk a lot about resilience and um, have actually put together um, some planning work in this space, but in any of those plans, never did we have a global pandemic listed as one of the scenarios that we would be planning for. So, you know, I want to just start a little bit with in our world, sort of how this unfolded and, and um, like many of you, we were hearing things from across the country, across um, the globe, but where it really started to come into play for us in our local government operations was actually in our recreation facilities. And um, we started to hear from our customers that people were uncomfortable coming to the facilities, um, a lot of questions. And so we ended up that first week in, or the third week of March um, closing our city recreation facilities. And we were kind of in scramble mode. And on a Tuesday night, which is when our city council meets, um, 6 p.m. Tuesday nights, our city council is ready to meet. And at five o'clock that afternoon, we got an email notifying us that our mayor, our mayor pro tem, the city manager, two other council members, and two um, other city staff members had been exposed to COVID and needed to meet immediately quarantine. And so we, um, quickly, you know, had to cancel that council meeting because of lack of a quorum. And that's the point for me, me where I thought, wow, this is, um, this is really something we haven't experienced before and we are gonna need to figure out how to adapt. So as I move into my slides here, I wanna just spend some time um, on the next slide focusing on what as an organization um, really became our guiding principles through this and how it relates to our Baldridge journey. So um, one of the first things that we recognized is the need to focus on our people. And, you know, we know through Baldridge that um, workforce is a critical um, component of that. And so we agreed to make health and safety of our workforce really the first um, priority. We quickly moved into setting up remote work uh, facilities for people. We were modifying many of our policies in terms of telecommuting 
So we had to look at um, the structures and the framework that we had in place and how we could quickly adapt. Um, we did that. We made a decision early on to um, take a long-term view, even though we weren't sure what the short-term implications were going to be. So we uh, fairly early on had to furlough about 600 of our um, part-time employees who worked in those culture and recreation facilities. And we opted to continue paying them um, for their hours, even though they weren't able to work. At the same time when we were losing, you know, a approximately a million dollars a month in lost admissions and sales. But it was really critical to us that we were demonstrating a commitment to our workforce and that we were able to, um, you know, phase in and communicate well with them before we were going to have to make any sort of change. Um, as an organization, our core competency that we have identified in Baldridge is that we are um, our commitment to community. That is our core competency as an organization. And that has really been front and center for us um, during this entire um, time. So we have made changes in how we're delivering services. Um, any service that could be done remotely, we quickly put in place um, new ways of doing business and changes so that our community would not um, be impacted wherever we could prevent that. Um, we also looked at places as this has gone on, um, looking at resiliency, not just from an organization perspective for sure, but from a community lens. And so how are we leveraging resources both our own resources and also the resources that we're receiving um, from federal and, and state to support our business community, our nonprofits, and um, a particular emphasis on our vulnerable populations. The third um, guiding principle, if you will, or um, value that we were focusing on was really that financial resilience. So again, understanding just what the financial implications were going to be, um, doing a lot of different scenario planning. And one of the things that I'm really proud of in how we approached this was the way that we engaged our workforce in these conversations. So we um, engaged them in figuring out, you know, how they could help us save cost. Um, as we were looking at some bigger potential impacts, such as furloughs or um, even freezing retirement contributions, you know, we surveyed our workforce, we had face-to-face -face, um, via technology conversations with them and really engaged them in how do we uh, maintain financial resilience for our organization. I was just recently listening to a speaker talk about as leaders um, the importance of what do you stand for and I was connecting thinking about this presentation coming up and then I think you know uh, again as leaders in our organization we talk about that category one um, and for us this is what we stand for right we stand for our people we stand for our commitment to the community and we stand for um, really planning for the future through financial resiliency. So moving on, I wanna share just a few examples. I know we have limited time, um, but, but just some of the ways that this Baldridge framework played out for us. Um, one of the things that we, that we have learned as an organization or focused greater attention to through Baldridge are really our durable partners and those key partners. For us, some of those are our regional partners, and that came into play during this during this time. So you'll see here the Keep NOCO, that's Northern Colorado Open. Again, by leveraging those partners, we were able to really um, stretch our resources and provide consistency in messaging across the region um, in terms of wearing masks, facial coverings, the reason for this being to keep our businesses and our community opening are open um, to support our local business community. Again, we as an organization have two key customers, our business customer and our uh, resident customer. And so we focused um, on both through these efforts toward recovery. Um, 
we focused a lot on our vulnerable populations um, and again repurposing resources so the picture in the bottom middle here that you see um, is actually one of our recreation centers and as we were hearing from community members and service providers about the need to serve those who are most vulnerable we basically closed that facility to the public and um, turned it into a shelter for our homeless population with that again um, planning for what's our exit strategy going to look like and you know how do we balance these competing needs in our organization um you see hr connect city tech again i could spend um, hours talking about what we have done in the space of workforce and connecting our workforce um, with support resources of um, adapting the way we're delivering that information to employees so that people who were remote who maybe were working from outside our city network were able to access information people who had been furloughed could still access information so that connection to our city workforce um, has been something that has been really uh, some work that I'm proud of in our organization um, and as we again focus on resilience it's thinking long-term, how do we move into recovery? And our workforce is a critical, critical component of that. Um, from a financial resilience perspective, I just wanna highlight our budget process. We had to adapt. This has been a um, foundational element for us of our leadership system, um, is how we allocate resources in the organization. And during this time, part of Navigating with Resilience has been adapting our budget process, focusing on one year instead of two year. Um, I can't overstate the importance for us of being transparent during this time. And I think in all aspects, um, whether it's workforce, community, key partners, uh, we have really been working to be transparent. Um, the last thing I'll just note on here, we um, referenced the community protests and you know, I just wanna acknowledge that it's such a complex time and there are so many um, things that are influencing all of our decisions right now. And as a community, again, I'm, I'm really proud of our community that we have um, had engagement in some of these more challenging uh, social issues um, and as an organization, we're helping equip that by how we respond and by um, supporting people in peacefully vo uh, vocalizing differing opinions. So I just think there are a lot of um, really great things that are happening in this complex time, and it's also really challenging. So um, I want to give my co-panelists um, plenty of time and don't want to steal their time. So I'll just say in closing that I think, you know, the overall um, framework of Baldridge, I can't imagine going through this kind of radical change um, without having a framework already in place. And the fact that we have had such strong focus and clarity on what are our key competencies as an organization, who are our customers, how do we engage with them, um, how do we engage with our workforce has really um, equipped us well to navigate, I think, with agility and um, focus on the future. So I look forward to hearing from my pan fellow panelists and um, engaging in Q&A as we go forward. Thanks, Kelly. Our next guest is Patrick Lawton, City Administrator, City of Germantown, Tennessee. Thank you and uh, good morning and afternoon, everyone. It certainly is a pleasure to be with you all and share our COVID-19 journey and our Baldridge-based practices during this period of time. As a Baldridge organization, we know how the performance excellence criteria has shaped our organization um, to manage, not control, the COVID-19 pandemic. It's a virus and it has a mind of its own. But it, it has given us the opportunity to fall back on many of the key management and performance areas from Baldridge, the criteria focusing on such things as communication, agility, and the ability to pivot when necessary, data management, decision-making based upon data, societal responsibility, and engagement. Uh, and these are the areas from 
my organization's perspective where I'd like to spend my time today and talk about the items that are on this, this next slide. Um, one other thing I'd like to mention before I get into these three areas is a quote from, and, and there's been numerous people who've been uh, attributed to this quote, and that is Teddy Roosevelt has said it, Winston Churchill has said it, uh, probably most recently Rahm Emanuel has said it, uh, he was President Obama's chief of staff, and they've used some variation of this quote, and that is, never let a crisis go to waste. What it says loud and clear to us as a Baldridge winner, our organization is to, is to learn from this crisis, change what you are doing if necessary, plan for the future, document the heck out of everything, uh, and take intelligent risks. These are all Baldridge-based principles. Communication has been key to um, our ability to navigate uh, the crisis, COVID-19, during the past seven months. And, and one area in particular that I want to talk about that was so profound to us on our during, over the past several months is communicate the brutal facts, especially if it is difficult and, and hard to comprehend, as is COVID-19 and what we were all facing very quickly um, during the early months, uh, dur during, during the month of March. And I want to read to you a quote from Admiral James Stockdale, who spent eight years as a prisoner of war uh, during the Vietnam War. And, and here's the quote, and many of you, you know this already. Quote, you must never confuse faith that you will prevail in the end, which you can, which you can never afford to lose, with the discipline to confront the most brutal facts of your current reality, whatever they might be, close quote. And that's again from Admiral James Stockdale. As I mentioned, in early March, we quickly realized that we were about to enter a strange new world where life as we knew it would be changed forever, and there would be no old normal to go back to. Things would change, absolutely. So we, as an organization, as senior leaders, had to quickly communicate the brutal facts to our employees, um, and these were very difficult things to explain uh, in a very short period of time, such as making sure our folks know the brutal facts that there is no vaccine and that it's called a novel virus for a reason. We have no immunity to the virus. It's not a question of if but when you will get COVID-19. And in all of our efforts, we are only buying time until there is a vaccine. We will all learn to work remotely from home. There will in all probability be a global recession. PPE over the next year will become a fashion statement. We will not be out by Christmas. And the most sobering fact was people will die. However, we also told them that over and over and over again, that we will not give up hope and that we will get this, we will get through, through this together as an as a organizational family, even though we are apart. We said these things to give our people a basis for hope. And that is, we will survive, we will learn to adapt, we will advance, and we will thrive as an organization during this period of time and, and grow afterwards as well. Overwhelmed and not sure what to say or how to say it, once you communicate the brutal facts to your team in the clearest possible way with no ambiguity and give them, in addition to that, a basis for hope you can then, and only then, can you move into the problem solving mode and continue to move your organization forward, <clears throat> excuse me, and do something productive, not just sitting back about the crisis. Aldridge, in terms of data, ask us this specific question, how do you use reliable data and information to make decisions? From the beginning of the crisis, we were very clear throughout our whole team and our organization that our organization would make decisions regarding our community and our employees based on data and not dates. So oftentimes people are very quick to run to a particular date and time and say, things are gonna happen by this time and everything will be fine. Or, you know, we need to be opening by May 1, those type of things. All of our decisions were based upon <clears throat> on data, which Aldridge stresses. Because this was first and foremost a public health crisis, we had to rely on a set of metrics 
from our partners in the public health field. Our residents rely on city services to provide these essential services for our residents. In order to do that, we needed to understand our current situation day by day, week by week, month by month. We make decisions best based upon the best leading and lagging indicators reported regularly to us on a weekly basis by the health department. And focusing on such things as in terms of data where you can make informed decision, such as the infection rate. What is taking place in terms of, of something I've learned, the, the row knot, how is it growing throughout our county and throughout our community? What is the healthcare capacity? How do we plan for the surge effectively? And what is city government's role in working with our healthcare providers in making those decisions? Do we have sufficient contact tracing? That is key. Do we have enough contact tracers out there and we, can we pinpoint where the infections are coming from? Are we in compliance with public health measures? Understanding what, what that looks like and making sure that our business community and our residents know what is expected of them. And finally, what factors determine one, do we go back to business? I know uh, we'll talk a little bit about the economic factor here in just a second, but, but this is first and foremost a health crisis. Um, however, small businesses were hit the hardest. And I think as we all know, small businesses in this country account for about half of all US jobs. And as we also all know, <clears throat> excuse me, unemployment it is, at a, is at a record high. To identify our current and ongoing fiscal position, we developed a task force, internal task force of city employees to accomplish the following. Number one, assess the impact of the economic contraction within our key industries. And number two, assess the fiscal impact of the contraction on local city revenues and spending. This understanding of the local economy led us to the decision to not, again, not looking at dates, but data to not adopt our budget at the beginning of fiscal year 21, which started July 1. We passed a continuing budget resolution, which gave us the opportunity to sit back and look at what was happening with the, the, the economic free-for-all that we found ourselves in and trying to identify anything that looked remotely like a trend. So we, so we were not faced with having to make what I would call draconian cuts in our budget because we didn't have enough data or we didn't have enough time to analyze that information. So we pushed our budget adoption back to uh, up to September 1 uh, in compliance with, with state law and the state comptroller's office. Um, so that was very effective for us in terms of a lot of the decisions that we made going forward and, and how we manage through the crisis. I want to talk about our folks here next. Data-driven decisions have had an extreme impact on how we engage with our employees. There was and still is a great deal of anxiety surrounding COVID-19. As an employer of choice, the city of Germantown, with an overall employee engagement score of 86 out of 100, and a city net promoter score of 71, we know that the success of our organization is built upon our people, our employees, the men and women of the city of Germantown who are proud to work here. Therefore, we made the decision early on that there would be no layoffs. We adopted and communicated a we are in it together mentality as an organizational family, and that we would sacrifice among all employee groups without compromising our service levels. In return for this commitment, our employees have become the ones who have developed the creative solutions to our financial and service delivery issues. And I would add that they are even more engaged and committed because of what we're doing as senior leaders. We also focused on technology, on the technology at our disposal and provided the opportunity for our employees to work safely and remotely from home, something that was, has been embraced. And now, obviously, as a local government, not everybody can do that. Police and fire, uh, other public safety workers, fire and EMS, they need to be here in public works. But where we could, we wanted to make sure that our people had the proper equipment and that they were safe working remotely from home. Finally, with the understanding that we are just one COVID-19 case away from taking down an entire police shift or fire shift, or dispatch area, we developed our own internal contact tracing program for our employees only. And it is based upon a program, and, and you all can have access to this, it's based upon a program developed by 
Bloomberg Philanthropies and John Hopkins University, but, but we've developed it with our fire department and with our HR department. And it's a very effective way to understand and keep a pulse of what's happening with your workforce by protecting um, their confidentiality, uh, but also understanding the spread of the virus within our workforce because we provide crucial and essential services. It has been a difficult seven months and our Baldridge based practices have allowed us to buy time during the pandemic to maintain service levels and weather the storm. And I'm very proud of the, the folks who work for our community and our, our senior leadership. Thank you, Al. Thanks, Patrick. Our final guest is Tommy Gonzalez, City Manager, El Paso, Texas. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. What I wanna talk about is how a good plan, you know, having a vision for an organization can get you to the places you need to get to and see things that may not be visible uh, in the present. I know that when we were able to put a strategic plan in place in Irving, Texas, it really took us to, to great heights and you know, new heights. And it's not been any different in El Paso. The city of El Paso did not have a strategic plan in 2014. So we did a, um, a lot of groundwork in order to make that happen. And it was consummated in January 15. It was then updated in 17 with a 20 and 2020 plan. And then in 2019, it was uh, updated again with a 25 and 2025 plan. In between those two years, however, we uh, really launched uh, an effort to work with 14 other organizations in our own backyard. And then we called it the Communities of Excellence. And I serve on the Communities of Excellence 2026 board. And I had the question whenever they'd asked me to have more input, I said, well, I need to see, you know, where the value is here, where the value proposition is. And so I started, we started working on that here. And what we did is we met with these educational, we met with the public health, we met institutions, we met with the hospitals, uh, we met with all these different areas where we would improve our economy together, we would improve public health together, we would improve, improve education together. And it was very important because, you know, I know you probably have heard of that when, when organizations, and governments, local governments get together and get in a room and it's really hard for them to get along. Well, we actually had a game plan. We we had Mac McGuire, our, our CEO of Quality Texas, which I'm the chair of, come in and, and give a Baldridge champion training. And so we did that piece in the framework and taught them that. We had a lot of them get on the journey. And as a matter of fact, there's two other organizations and ourselves that applied for the state version of the Communities of Excellence Award and, and really started working on the behalf of the community. But the important piece of that is it wasn't just holding hands and singing Kumbaya and saying, oh, look, we're working together and then no, no real result. What we did is we, we, we taught all these groups the framework. We got them on the Baldrish journey. Number one. Number two, we worked on a program with all the schools where in all the school districts, we have five in our backyard. With five school districts, we had a total of 400 kids. We taught them the budget. Uh, then they came in and presented the city's budget to the city council. So imagine that, to have kids learn what they learn in math, right? And then put it into practice and then present it to the city council and depoliticize something that's very political. So we did that. And then the third thing is we're sharing best practices of these 15 organizations together so that we learn from each other. So those are three real tangible results that we really got a lot of benefit out of. And, and again, having a vision in terms of working together, right? So our vision is El Paso will have safe and beautiful neighborhoods, a vibrant regional economy and exceptional recreational, cultural and educational opportunities with a high powered government. And, and we're able to to, to explain, describe, and show where we're able to get results in all those areas. I won't go into all of that because we're limited in time, but the point of that is, is that we're working towards that the entire time in our strategic plan. W why is that important? Well, when you face something like what we have faced, you're then armed with all the tools, all the partners that are naturally there. So when we had the Communities of Excellence uh, group, we also, the fourth thing we did is we did training together. We did examiner training together and we had 110 people from eight different organizations, um, excuse me, from eight different states and from, from like, I think 16 organizations all show up to that training. 
And it was a lot of the people in the COE that I mentioned before. And then it was a lot of people from different states that Mac has brought into the fold that they came, came in and got training. So what that enabled us to do is to have some camaraderie, train together, learn together. And a lot of the agency heads from those groups, they came in and got trained. Why is that important? I'm going to talk to you why that's important. Why is it important to have a vision, to have a strategic plan, and then to be able to utilize those to exercise strong leadership? Well, you're able to then be prepared, not so much that we you can see everything that's invisible, right? Because there's a there's a, a quote that says that's what that's what the a vision is, right? That's what leadership is, to see what's invisible, it's invisible to others. But it's that it prepared us because when we had the immigration crisis in our backyard, which over the last 12 to 18 months, we've been in a crisis mode. It was the immigration crisis. So then we had to reach out to all the different partners to work with them and they picked up my call, they would be texting. We already had phone numbers. I mean, we already, we already had a communication network and we already had that connection, that true connection, uh, because we had done all that groundwork before by having a plan, by working the plan, but then bringing in the communities of excellence concept and then being able to already kind of know each other. And then August 3rd happened in our community where, where a, a racist came in and killed 23 people. And, and he didn't just kill the people he wanted to kill. He ended up killing really the demographic makeup of, of our community. So we had people there that got killed from, from Mexico. We had people there that got killed uh, because you know they were at Fort Bliss, so they were Anglos. Uh, you know, so we had really, it was almost, it was eerie the same number the 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 demographic makeup made up who got killed it was it was really sad but during that time we were able to work with one of the schools because one one of the uh, superintendents in plano wanted to cancel a football game and it was just very i don't know it was sad it was and, and i remember getting a call from two council members and they were crying and they were like they can't do this to our kids and i tell you i lost it you know and when i mean by that i, I got very emotional and i I think I hung up on them. I said, well, let, let me see what I can do because they wanted me to contact contacts I had from Irving from when I was a city manager there and contact the Dallas Cowboys. So I did. And the Cowboys came through big time and, and it wasn't me that did it. It was them. But the point that I'm making is um, when I reached out to the superintendent of his Sleta, which is in our backyard, he was a little surprised and he didn't know how to take it. But because we had had that relationship and, 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 you know, let's be honest, in bigger cities and in any city, superintendents and city managers and all these different agency heads don't necessarily get along. And there's these personas and there's these there's these personalities. Uh, but I did that for the kids and he saw that. And and when we were able to make that happen, you know, I gave him, gave the, the school district all the credit because it wasn't about getting that to happen. It was about the kids. It was about not showing the kids that adults make these bad mistakes of canceling a football game. You don't do that. You don't do that anywhere, but especially in Texas, you don't cancel a football game. And, and so that was just something that really, what was one more example of how that relationship really helped us kind of, kind of deal with all these different problems. So on, on top of that, with our plan, we were part of the top 100 cities in the, in the 100 resilient cities throughout the world. There was a thousand cities. We, we integrated that resiliency plan into our strategic plan. We're the only city to have done that. And that was very important. And I say that because of what we're talking about today, because that enabled us uh, not only on the financial side, operational side, and the health side, you know, in terms of resiliency and really practice that. So we really were thinking through a lot of, you know, how do you prepare for the, the things that, you, you know, you can't prepare for. So back in January, we submitted to council a, a plan on a rate stabilization fund. And we had two or three of them that they didn't know what it was and, and, and they weren't for it. And then we came back with more data. Anyway, they, they finally approved it. After it got approved, two weeks later, the pandemic hit. So it, it really is a testament to good planning, um, having a vision, you know, driving the organization to excellence, driving the organization towards resiliency, preparedness, um, to really help us kind of attack a lot of these different issues that everyone's talked about already. So when we dealt with the COVID-19 response, we put together, because we're really big on breaking down silos, we put together uh, 12 different senior leaders on a cross-functional team to report out at every single council meeting on every aspect of this COVID response. 
whether it's the testing piece, which was which everyone has big questions about in terms of the numbers of the, to get tested, the the business piece in terms of how to re, do a business recovery plan, the the health piece in general in terms of we have a live active El Paso. We're encouraging everyone to to work out, uh, and and there's different statistics on there on our El Paso Strong .org, a website in terms of helping businesses and educating them. So you're just not citing them because they're trying to come back online. And you citing them versus educating them, you know, there's two different ways of doing that, right? We, we've chosen the carrot approach in, in, instead of the stick approach. So that was really, really important for us to put that cross-functional team together so that we were able to, to really be very comprehensive in our response. So the first meeting we had was six and a half hours. And I know you're probably thinking, well, that's very inefficient and that was a big fail. No, it was six and a half hours because our presentation was about an hour and a half. There was a bunch of questions the council had and we've been having that meeting ever since this this hit so we had that cross-functional team update and then we poured that out into the community and did uh, or took advantage of the coe concept and now we have a community cross-functional team with the same effect you know with with uh, having the health piece more involved with uh, with the hospitals the the business community so it's really really worked out for us so that we're able to focus on the health, economic, and financial piece. And it really has helped us educate the public, uh, communicate more effective, effectively with the public, because no matter how much information you put out there, there's gonna be people that are concerned, right? And that, they, and that they're going to want to have as much data as possible in order to, uh, to feel better about what's going on. The, the other thing I wanted to add in terms of engaging the, the, the customer We've also engaged our workforce uh, through town halls that we continue to have uh, virtually and and that we, you know, we do something with that data. I mean, like, for example, we we changed up how we do uh, Thanksgiving pickup for uh, the uh, the recycling and, and the sanitation. And now they get they get that day off. Um, but there's a lot of communication with our employees to those town hall meetings. But but the most important aspect of of our reaching out to our departments is at the concept we've came up with is the top 500 we have uh, and we did this in irving we have our middle management that that leads the entire city and you've heard that culture eats strategy for breakfast and all that kind of stuff you've heard a lot of those kinds of phrases um, so we have communicated with the 500 on a regular basis i send them emails and it's a very interactive process so then when we had a town hall with the 500 and we had the the q a you know they they talk about the emails that i send them and they talk about the things that are some of them are inspirational e emails some of them are challenging emails uh and some of them are things that just keep them focused on the task at hand so that's how we can keep that communication flow with them and then the the second part uh, to my presentation on the second page that I wanted to, to talk about is I wanted to talk about, you know, the actual uh, events of what we do to, to attack financial concerns, right, and how, how we save money. So over the course of that, that, that uh, strategic plan and the work that, that has gone into it, we have saved 99 million in the last five and a half years. And we have brought in an additional 285 million of new revenue. Uh, and before you think, well, that's all tax increases. No, we brought in state dollars. Uh, we, we, we brought in uh, ways to save money with Lean Six Sigma programs on the savings side. Anyway, I won't bore you with all the details, but all of that set us up to deal with these, with these catastrophes. And we were in a better position to, to deal with them because we were, we were well healed financially and we weren't before. I mean, like right now, uh, we're about to double our fund balance. You know, when I got here, it was at a certain amount. And now we're going to be doubling it in this fiscal year that's coming up. So it was very important that when we when we attacked this problem, that we did it smartly. That we also took care of the employees. You know, we paid for the ones we furloughed. We paid for their health care through through the rest of the fiscal year, and then we pushed that to the rest of the calendar year. So that was very important to us too, as was pointed out by some of the others that have spoken already. So I, I did want to mention that. But the other key part that we did, and it goes hand in glove with um, how we've broken down silos, is we've really collapsed positions together in senior management positions. And if you know, we have managing directors now, we have one director who's in charge of two departments. That 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 concept is saved as a million dollars to add to the other four million that we saved on the organizational realignments. So that's that's been very uh, 
successful and very important in terms of development and in terms of the succession implementation program that we have for organization and, and pushing our departments to do more and pushing our people to truly lead an organization. So that, that is, that is a, um, a quick synopsis of, of what we have done in the last four or five years uh, that, that again is, is very uh, well grounded with a lot of the Baldrige framework. Uh, again, we push the strategy, the strategic plan and, and strong leadership um, we push it quite a bit and, and we practice it through the different programs we have, whether they're employee town hall meetings or whether they're, they're those ways we, we stay in touch with them through email and through different messages we send uh, on a regular basis. So that concludes my portion of the presentation. Thanks, Tommy. We will now go to questions from the audience. The first question goes to Kelly. And that is, give one example of a system or process that will operate differently in your organization post-COVID. Well, I could give lots of examples, um, but I think that one uh, sort of system level example is going to be around our remote work experience. Um, we have realized that we can do this very effectively and both from a service delivery standpoint for our organization. So um, I think services that before we we felt had to be offered in person um, were able, some of our building inspections, things like that, we have made some changes that I anticipate are going to continue um, really from this point going forward. Uh, another one, and I, I know you asked for one, but just one other quick one. Uh, in terms of our, our form of government and our public engagement with our city council meetings, we're right now operating in a hybrid model, and I um, will be surprised if we ever go back to a time where the only way to engage with city council meetings is to physically come down to city hall. I think this more expanded access and a hybrid um, format is something that will continue uh, again from, from this point forward. So I could give lots of other examples, but those are a couple. Okay, this next one goes to Tommy. You mentioned communities of excellence partners as school districts, universities, and hospitals. What about El Paso Community College? If not, why not? El Paso Community College was part of that. Um, I was trying to rest through what I was saying, but El Paso Community College, UTEP, and um, all the school districts were part of it. So they're very much a part of it. And one example of a result of that uh, collaboration is that with El Paso Community College, they help us with, with job training skills for economic development jobs that we bring into El Paso. For example, the Amazon jobs we're working on right now, we work very closely with them on that. And we work with them on every, pretty much every, uh, all the jobs that we, that, we, that we bring in. And then we're working with them on the Mexican American Cultural Center, uh, where they're going to be uh, doing the uh, culinary arts program. In other words, they're going to be running a restaurant on the rooftop of the Mexican American Cultural uh, facility that was something we came up with as a concept to do to do the restaurant on the rooftop because the weather's so gorgeous here uh, and and uh, we're partnering with them to do that so that's another way that we partner and then an example with UTEP where we're partnering is they're doing our continuous improvement certification program through Quality Texas so that's another example where that communities of excellence concept bared a lot of fruit it wasn't just a lot of talk Okay, the next question is for Patrick. How will your strategic planning change post COVID-19? Well, we will do an update to our Germantown Forward 2030 plan in next year. We were supposed to do it this year, but we will absolutely do it in, in calendar year 21. How, how it will change is we will go back and revisit our vision, mission, and value statement and make sure, as I mentioned earlier, that the this whole concept of never let a crisis go to waste, that, that we sit back and we understand what happened during this period of time, as I mentioned, learn from it, understand it, embrace it, and try to incorporate those changes into, into the strategic planning process. Uh, as Kelly mentioned, I, I think absolutely one of the things that will be incorporated will be how we conduct public meetings and how we engage with the public, whether it's it's a Board of Mayor and Alderman meeting or issuing a permit um, or just even how staff staff interacts. It will also, I think, allow us the opportunity to bring in more people from the community uh, to participate in the strategic planning 
process uh, via a virtual uh, via a virtual world. Great. Okay, Kelly, this one's for you. How will, you, how will you ensure the engagement of your staff if this pandemic continues longer than expected? How will you keep stakeholders focused on a new normal? Yeah, thanks for that question. So we have put in place, um, again, I think some really improved communication and engagement systems that are going to continue on. You know, one of the things that we did early on, again, in a commitment to communicate and over communicate is um, city manager sending out a daily email to our staff. Um, and while that sounds like it might be a lot, people really, really appreciated and found that to be a trusted source of information. Um, we also did some things like all employee forums where we would have, you know, hundreds of employees who were there asking live questions. So at an organizational level, we've done some things. We have weekly check-ins that our human resources department puts in place with managers to really get a sense of how our workforce is doing and also employee check-ins. Um, and then I think that um, equipping our managers to really engage at the work team level is where we're seeing some um, some improvement actually as a result of of this pandemic so some of our field crews like our electric um, field crews where they maybe were a little bit more disconnected historically you know they're again via technology now able to have really great conversations um, we talk from day one in new employee or in orientation at the city of fort collins um, about the it, the we, and the I. And so the it is around, does the work really give you meaning? The we is, do you care deeply about your colleagues and um, you know actually love the people that you work with? And then the I is, are your individual needs being met? And if so, it's probably the best place you've ever worked. We, um, I think, are living that, right? That's not just sort of a motto for us. We're living that right now. And as a result, I believe our workforce will continue to be engaged and um, help us see our way through this in really a positive way. Thanks, Kelly. Tommy, this next one's for you. Um, can you expand on how the pandemic has affected El Paso differently, being that it's a border city? Well, the the travel restrictions for one on non-essential trips was effective in March, like the 21st of March, I believe. So the U.S. Customs and Border Protection, they implemented more rigorous inspection procedures to discourage this non-essential travel across the border, increasing the wait times. So that really significantly uh, impacted uh, commerce. So there was a decline in vehicle and pedestrian crosses, um, crossings. No, no impact on commercial traffic, though. We wanted to keep that going, so we worked with the state and the feds on that part of it. Uh, but so not only was there a financial impact on the city, but many, many, many cross to to work, um, also for school and for for family. Uh, and then the folks who were crossing, since the um, underlying health conditions was a high risk, uh, the same restrictions in Mexico weren't uh, applied as they were in in America. So that's the reason our focus on wellness has has been so uh, so big for us. Uh, we are not claiming that if you're a healthy individual, you can't catch COVID and you won't die. But if you talk to doctors, not politicians, but if you talk to doctors, what they've told you, I know when I did, and I don't mind sharing this with y'all. When I did my annual executive physical, uh, my vitamin D level was really good, and then I had dropped six percent on body fat because I I started working out with a trainer, and I've never done that when COVID hit. And and so we've been really pushing the live active piece, and that's why we have a website on it, because uh, the the doctor at Cooper's Clinic said, you know, if people are people don't know this, but if they're in shape and their vitamin D levels aren't low, they, they get it, they're going to be able to work through it, and it, it's not going to take them down like it's doing most people. So we took that science and we pushed, you know, the same thing I'm saying with a bunch of caveats. We're not saying it's the panacea, but but if you're healthier. It's going to help you with anything. It's going to help you with psychological issues. It's going to help you with depression issues. It's going to help you with a lot of different things, including when you get sick, when you get the flu or anything else. So 
Uh, we really pushed that out because of the fact that we were on the border and we really needed to push that out. And we really pushed the idea of taking care of yourself for your family since that's a big part of the culture in this part of the country. Thanks, Tommy. Patrick, you're gonna get the last question here. Um, this one what says, could you describe where you are in the maturity process and image in the framework and how that has helped to sustain excellence in a crisis? That's a good question. Um, we've been on our Baldridge journey, uh, and I hope I'm answering the question correctly. We've been on our Baldridge journey for, for over 10 years. Um, you have to put the work in, you absolutely have to understand the criteria, um, understand the questions, tie your strategic planning to your leadership, making sure that that, that is meaningful and has value for your leadership team, because it all spins out of your vision, value, and, and mission statement. Uh, nothing else works without that. And so it's it's taken us a period of time, these 10 years, I think, to, to get to that point. Um, you have to continue to put the work in. We first received the uh, Excellence Award from the Tennessee Center for Performance Excellence, a very rigorous Baldridge-based uh, program, very proud of that in 2017. Uh, and made the decision to move forward for the uh, for the national award. But again, we're taking steps along the way to make sure that we have an organization that is supportive of the work that we're doing. I think one of the largest components of that in terms of maturity is if you look at our employee engagement, um, these things don't happen um, unless you have the people, the heart and soul of your organization, um, involved and plugged in and dedicated to public service. We're, we're all in this business for a reason. Uh, we love to serve the public, we love to solve problems, um, but it, again, it doesn't happen unless your employees are fully engaged. And I can tell you 10 years ago, we probably weren't there, but over time, as we've developed employee engagement models and tools and surveys for our people, productivity has, has increased tremendously. And, and it's all because of our employees are engaged and they feel part of this program. We, we I love the Baldridge framework, but, but we, sometimes we don't talk about Baldridge. We talk about our organizational DNA. We talked about excellence every day, but it's all based on and predicated on the, the Baldridge excellence framework. And um, we still have a long way to go. We don't let up on, uh, on anything and we challenge each other uh, in, in this organization every day to do more and, and practice and put in place with our what our tagline is, and that is excellence every day. Thank you, Patrick. And to Kelly and Tommy for taking time out of your busy schedules to be here with us today to share your experience, insights, and best practices. We are now going to hear from Bob Fangmeyer, Director, Baldridge Performance Excellence Program. Bob? Thanks, Jerry, and thanks to our panelists. Wonderful uh, information and congratulations on all you've done. Um, we're a little bit tight on time, so I'm gonna focus on two things with this update. First, I'm gonna share with you some information about uh, the Pledge to America's Workers Presidential Award. And then I'll share a little bit about a new initiative we have working with a couple of MEP programs, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Programs in both Florida and Illinois. So the Pledge to America's Workers Presidential Award, I will refer to it as PAPA, just to save time, um, is something I've mentioned to this audience and the larger Baldridge uh, community a number of times. It's a collaboration with the Department of Commerce, the Department of Labor, and the White House to develop a, a presidential award to recognize excellence in workforce education and training that was born out of a couple of different executive orders that were issued in 2018. However, it's important to understand that our engagement in this effort was not a given. It truly was an intelligent risk in that it would not be good for the Baldridge program and the Baldridge brand to be affiliated with an award that perhaps wasn't particularly robust or rigorous or results based but it's far better to be involved and guide this initiative in a direction that would be sure to benefit the Baldridge Enterprise and enhance our, our sort of shared purpose of improving performance and sustainability of organizations and to improve the quality of life in the US. So that's what we've done. We dove in and had took on a key leadership role in designing, implementing, and managing 
the evaluation and recommendation processes for this award. As I've shared a number of times before, while this award is Baldridge based, it is derived from the Baldridge criteria and the Baldridge evaluation process. It's not a Baldridge award. This is not even an award that covers all of the information in category five workforce from the Baldridge Excellence Framework. This is a very thin slice that's focused on processes and results around workforce education and training and how well those processes are aligned to what's important for that organization and how well integrated they are with other key processes. So clearly Baldridge based, but not a Baldridge award. Yesterday, we had the privilege and the pleasure to participate in the first ever award ceremony for uh, the Pledge to America's Workers Presidential Award. And at the ceremony were Secretary Ross and Special Advisor Ivanka Trump. And we recognized nine organizations out of 30 applicants who represented large and small manufacturers, large and small service organizations, as well as a variety of trade associations and trade unions. Those recipients, they all demonstrated excellence in their workforce education and training efforts. They had strong results from those efforts and they more than upheld their commitments that they had made through the Pledge to America's Workers. I'm gonna run through the list of the recipients since I didn't have time to update this slide with their names. Uh, first, the American Hotel and Lodging Association, the Associated Builders and Contractors, Lockheed Martin Corporation, the National Retail Federation, Northrop Grumman Corporation, Oberg Industries, Textron Inc., Volkswagen Group of America, and Zurich North America. Our next steps to reach out to all those applicants to congratulate them on their accomplishments, encourage them to continue their efforts to achieve excellence, refer them to some of our resources, our state and regional Baldrige-based programs that are members of the Alliance, and we need to survey those applicants, the recipients, and the evaluators for opportunities for improvement. And finally, we need to begin planning for the future of this award. So, Next, I just want to spend just a minute or so talking about uh, this new initiative, a collaboration with two MEP programs, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership run by NIST from Florida and Illinois. And we're working together to develop a Baldridge-based assessment tool and an evaluation process that'll be managed by MEP centers to determine how well prepared those organizations are for the transformative wave and known as manufacturing or industry 4.0. To keep it simple, think robotics, artificial intelligence, etc. The idea is to engage these small and medium-sized manufacturers in a Baldrige-based assessment, and then, as with the PAPA award, engage them with the larger Baldrige enterprise to help them expand their efforts to achieve and sustain high performance. And I will stop there. Thank you for your time, and I will turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Jerry and Al and uh, the foundation. I'll be really quick. We only have about a minute and a half left and uh, I have less than that amount of content. A qu couple of quick updates for those of you that are not familiar. The Alliance for Performance Excellence is the network of 28 local, state, regional and sector Baldridge based programs across the United States. So we're the, the, we're the front door of Baldridge, if you will. Uh, the biggest thing to share with you all is uh, the Baldridge Prop Conference is next month. It's focused on resilience, agility, and innovation, October 21 and 22. Main event is on the 22nd. Pre-conference is on the 21st with some really great um, speakers. Uh, one focused on getting acquainted with Baldridge, one more intermediate from moving in, from interest to action. Uh, there's a, a separate high, higher education summit on the 21st. So if you liked today's case studies, and I, I really enjoyed the three speakers today, you're going to love digging into uh, more Baldridge recipients' comments on how they're navigating today's challenges and, and achieving and sustaining excellence. So uh, consider coming to the Baldridge Fall Conference. The other things listed here are some updates on the Alliance. We're, we're working heavily with Communities of Excellence, which is an effort to uh, insert Baldridge into communities to help improve community outcomes. Um, more on that at another day. And the marketing plan I'll mention is um, we are the, the Baldrige Enterprise's front door. And so we are all trying to grow the number of organizations, communities using this framework. Uh, so we're really concentrating an effort on, on doing just that in, in making, uh, improving the awareness of the, the value of this framework and getting more involved. 
So more to come. And I think I'm out of time, so I'll stop right there. Thanks, Brian. Just like to remind everybody that you can train with us online through the Foundation's Institute for Performance Excellence. I wanted to once again thank Kelly, Patrick, and Tommy for such an engaging conversation today. That is the purpose of these webinars, to bring you relevant contemporary issues and best practices to help you lead your organizations. And lastly, thanks to our sponsors and donors out there, especially the Mac Baldrige Society, who are the Institute trustees, the Baldrige family, Adventist Health, Stellar Solutions, and Midway USA. Once again, thank you so much for attending today and enjoy your weekend.